Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 7th of the 12th month, which happens to line up with the 18th of February, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are going to be covering a sermon from Ralph Ernstein. We've already read one of them on here and recorded it called El's Great Name. And this one is called The Best Match or The Incomparable Marriage between the creator and the creature. It says this was delivered in two discourses at Calros, but the precise time and occasion cannot be ascertained. Only we see the first edition was printed anno 1722. And this information is from the life works of Ralph Ernstein, where it has his preaching and his biography. You can find them freely available online. I usually pick them up at archive.org, both for him and his brother. If you don't recall, and if you look up, there's two more sermons that we have, one by Ralph Ehrenstein called El's Great Name, and the other one by Ebenezer Ehrenstein, his elder brother. And that was about Ezekiel's dry bones, the Valley of Dry Bones, and the Ruach HaKodesh, the come four winds and breathe upon these slain that they may live. In those two videos... We went over how they were foretold in a book called The Ancient History of Caldonia to be eminent preachers during the time where the cloud of Elohim's wrath was turned away from his people. They helped found the Reformed Church, separating from the Anglican Church, right? They helped found the Reformed Assembly at that time and brought national repentance and benefit to their people. So if you want, you can see those videos for that, and it goes into the history. It, we read about the excerpt from the ancient history of Caledonia and the foretelling concerning them, about their mother having them both after she had died and came back from the dead. And then we also read the article or the section that was from Ebenezer Ehrenstein's personal notes about that very event happening. So I encourage you to look those up if you feel like it. Okay. But back on point, this is, thy maker is thy husband, Yeshiyahu, or Isaiah, which means Yeshiyahu, it's the deliverance is of Yahuwah, it's the, it's the opposite of Yahushua, Yahuwah is our deliverance, right? But Yeshiyahu 54.5. The foreteller Yeshiyahu, having largely discoursed of the sufferings of Mashiach and the Baruch fruits and effects of them, among which one is that he should have a numerous seed to believe on him, and that when the Yahudi reject him, the Gentiles should gladly receive him. And thus foreseen by the Ruach of foretelling, the majestic state of the Gentile assembly. He breaks forth into a song of triumph in the beginning of this chapter, where the foreteller directs his speech to the assembly and spouse of Elohim in these words. Now, I'm going to try not to do this too much, but they weren't aware that all of Britain were from the lost tribes, right? That not the only ones from them but a large portion, what we'd call Ephraim and foretelling. They, they didn't know that at the time. He specifically was from the Caledonians, who were originally a different branch that came over in a different time. But just to recap, the Caledonians were survivors of Troy that kept the law, what they called the law of the altar, in trust, and they were protected for a very long time. They went from Troy to Crete, from Crete to Sicily, from Sicily to Gaul, where we call France, and then from there to what we call Scotland. There was other survivors of Troy that also inhabited to the land there, but they went from Troy, and they were paganized, if you, would, if you will. They went from Troy to Italy, and then three generations later, Brutus went, delivered some slaves that were Trojans and then went over to Spain and then over to Lude or Britain and founded the city of Lude, which became London. And Brutus was the first monarch or leader of those people in southern Great Britain, right? 
but they're related tribes. It was generally Yahuda reigning over the people and Ephraim with those joined with him. Okay. So they would become the Melohagoim. It was foretold of Ephraim or the fullness of the Gentiles, the fullness of the nations, as they say. And this is the truth of what we can see in history we'll, that we'll get to in time. This is the majestic state of the Gentile assembly. He breaks forth into a song of triumph in the beginning of this chapter, where the foreteller directs his speech to the assembly and spouse of Elohim in these words. Seeing, O barren, thou that didst break, or didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. Thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith Yahuwah. Where we have a magnificent promise of the or fertility and the felicity of the Gentile assembly. And this is enlarged to the fifth verse, which contains the words of our text, where we have the reason of her happiness and fruitfulness, who was formerly a barren widow, because she was divorced and cast away. Oh. For thy maker is thy husband. He who made you out of nothing, and therefore can easily fulfill all these promises, how unlikely soever they seem to be. He who made you a people, yea, which is more, who made you his people, he will take possession of you as his spouse and act the part of a husband to you. I shall defer my further introduction and exposition, and also whatever might be said concerning the external relation betwixt Mashiach and the visible assembly. My chief design being at this time only to speak a little to that internal spiritual marriage relation betwixt Mashiach and the invisible assembly, or Mashiach and the believer, as it is represented under the picture of a marriage, and what I would offer upon this subject, I lay before you in this do doctrinal proposition. That there is a marriage relation betwixt or between Mashiach and believers, wherein he supplies the, the place of a husband unto them, and they the place of a bride and spouse to him. In persecuting whereof, I would essay these three things. One, to prove that there is such a marriage relation betwixt Mashiach and believers. Two, speak to the nature of this marriage. Three, give the reasons why Mashiach comes under such a relation to his people. Four, make some application of the subject. One, to confirm the doctrine that there is a marriage relation betwixt Mashiach and believers. This will appear from these two considerations. From the compilations given to Mashiach with relation to believers, how frequently does the spouse call him her husband in the book of the song? As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Song of Songs 2, 3, and 16. And says the emissary in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin unto Mashiach. 2. The marriage relation betwixt Mashiach and believers appears from the designation given to believers in the scripture with respect to Mashiach. How frequently he calls, or calls he her his love, his spouse, in the book of the Song of Songs. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. Song of Songs 4, 9 and 10. In Revelation 19, 7, there the assembly, or believers in the collective capacity, is called the bride, the lamb's wife, 
the marriage of the Lamb is come, and the bride has made herself ready. We need not stand to prove that which is so evident. We need say no more to confirm it than to repeat the text, Your Maker is your husband. Therefore I come to number two. To speak of the nature of this marriage, and here we would briefly consider, one, the parties married, two, the terms of the marriage, three, the properties of the marriage, four, the effects of it, five, how the match is carried on, six, how it is concluded. One, I say, let us consider the parties married. Who is the bridegroom and who is the bride? Number one, then the bridegroom is the wisdom of El, and all the treasures of Hokma, or wisdom, and knowledge are found in him. He knows all the needs of the bride and is ready to supply them. On the other hand, the bride, before her matching with him, is the most notorious fool out of hell. Her folly is shown by continuing to refuse to match with him to refuse to give her consent to the Shemaim, or heavenly bridegroom. 2. The bridegroom is the eternal son of El, the king's only son. The king made a marriage for his son. He is the blood royal of Shemaim. On the other hand, what is the bride's pedigree? She needs not boast of her descent. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother a Hittite, Ezekiel 16.3. There is a vast difference here. Number three. The bridegroom is the heir of all things. He has all riches, the unsearchable riches of Mashiach. But what is the bride worth before he match with her? She is worse than nothing, poverty itself, and not only a beggar but in debt and Mashiach is willing to pay her debt. Number four. The bridegroom is comely and esteemed. All the seraphim and cherubim above, all the sons of men in the world, all the crowned heads on earth, in all the circumstances of esteem, are but like black pieces of earth compared to this esteemed bridegroom. On the other hand, what is the bride before he match with her? Even as black as the Satan can make her, not only a leopard spotted here and there, but wholly black and ugly. When she is cast forth in the open field to the loathing of her person, she is a spectacle of horror and misery. Yet then it is a marriage day and a time of love. Number two. What are the terms of the marriage, the articles of it on his part and her part? The terms on her part, though the whole belong to Mashiach, yet to speak of terms in an improper sense, he requires of her what he works in her, namely, first, that she be divorced from all other husbands and give up with all other lovers and idols particularly that she be divorced from the law, that she may be married unto Mashiach. And this will be explained in the course of time, but this is just like saying you can't, you can't work your way to deliverance. You don't do his will and keep the Torah to be delivered from the wrath to come because we've already sinned and fallen short. That she may be married unto Mashiach, she must not obey the law from a principle of her own strength, nor as a covenant of works, that by obedience she may purchase the title to Shemaim, nor to gratify a natural conscience, nor merely to escape hell and make a righteousness of her obedience. And then I put in my own words right here. It says, we have all sinned and fallen short under the curse and in need of a redeemer. If we do not acknowledge that, the truth is not in us. She must be divorced from that husband. 
number two, or the second. Upon her part, it is it was required that she be satisfied with this husband alone as the great portion of her soul, or the soul, that he may have no rival, no competitor in her affections, none to sit on the throne with him. She must keep the chief room for the son of El. Again, on his part, he contracts, first, that he will make her, or he will make over himself to her, all he is, all he has, all he has purchased, all he has promised. He will make over to her all the Baraka of the everlasting covenant. Oh, this is a sweet article, and a large charter indeed. Second, he contracts to perform all the esteemed offices of a husband to her, to provide for her, protect her, direct her, pity her, clothe her, to encourage and comfort her, and to do all for her she needs. This is the sum of the contract, for to speak properly, Mashiach is all and does all in this matter. And our part is done by him in us. Hosea 2, 19 and 20. I will betroth you unto me forever. I will betroth you unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in compassions. I will even betroth you unto me in steadfast fidelity and you shall know Yahuwah. Mashiach signs the contract for him and her both. I will betroth you unto me in righteousness. I will fulfill the law and satisfy Elohim's righteousness. I will betroth you unto me in loving kindness. <clears throat> Though there be nothing in you to, divide, to invite my love, but much to challenge my aversion, yet I will overcome all my imperfections and set my love upon you. I will betroth you unto me in mercies, in pardoning mercy, set apart mercy, supporting mercy, comforting mercy. Yet least the bride think that whatever she sins, that whenever she sins there may be a divorce, she may break up and go away. Therefore it follows, I will betroth you unto me in steadfast fidelity. This is the word for amuna, which means trust or trustworthiness, faith and faithfulness, steadfast fidelity, and belief. He pledges his veracity for fulfilling the articles on her part and his both. But then, number three, what are the properties of this marriage? One, it is a very mysterious marriage that the Creator should take the work out of His hands for a bride, not only when in its original and virgin integrity, as it dropped out of His creating hands, but when polluted with the poison of the devil, the venom of the serpent, that He should take her for His bride. Thy Maker is thy husband. This is an astonishing union. If an esteemed messenger should be matched with a creeping worm and a king with a beggar, it would not be such a wonder. But the maker to join himself to the work of his hands, there cannot be a greater distance conceived between anything than between a creator and that which is brought out of the barren womb of nothing, a creature, and yet they are in a marriage relation. Thy maker is thy husband. 2. This marriage is very difficult and hard. It is true, there is nothing too hard for omnipotence. Yet, the man's nature of Mashiach had much to do with it. Though he was supported by Elohim's nature, yet he behooved to swim through the river of his own blood before he could get his bride. He satisfied the righteousness of Elohim, 
established a new covenant. All this must be done in order to this marriage. 3. This marriage is an indissolvable marriage. Death dissolves other relations, but it increases this intimate union. Nothing shall separate Mashiach and the believer. I am persuaded, saith Shaul, that neither life nor death, nor messengers, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is in Mashiach Yahushua, our Yahuwah. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Number four, what are the effects of this marriage? First, the first and immediate effect is a most close union between Mashiach and the believer. This union, though less than a personal union, although it be in some respect, yet it is more than a political union, more than a moral union. It is a very close union. And uh, the loving one sticks closer than a brother, it mentions in the Proverbs. The aluf, related to the word alf, alif or alfim, is a close personal relation or friend, which is, he is the alif and the tau. It's a related word. The bridegroom, Mashiach, he gives his bride his own ruach, or spirit, communicates vital influences from the esteemed head to her, and she cleaves by steadfast fidelity or belief and love close to him. And Elohim promises that he will make the house of Yisrael cleave close to him as a girdle to the loins of a man. Yeremiyahu or Jeremiah 13.11 He makes his spouse, in spite of all her folly, in spite of all her enmity, in spite of all her enemies and temptations, to cleave close to him. 2. Another effect of this union is sweet communion, mutual fellowship. He feasts with them and they with him. He blows upon her garden, quickens and animates her favors, and then he comes and eats his pleasant fruits. And those are allusions to the Psalm of Solomon, or Song of Songs, if you will. <clears throat> Three. Another effect is familiarity, which is coincident with the former. He treats them not as strangers, but as friends. And not only as friends, but as his own spouse. He communicates to her, and speaks conform or comfortably and kindly to her. It is a wonder what condensation Elohim will make sometimes, and the believer again can be more familiar with Eloah than with the whole world, and can tell to Elohim what he can tell to none else. Thus you see some of the effects of this marriage. Number five. How was the match carried on? Well, in a word, or I answer in a word, on his part it was carried on thus. First, he gave the father his hand and engaged to him in a covenant of redemption from eternity that he would do all things necessary for accomplishing the marriage. Second, because there must be a union of natures between the bridegroom and the bride, it was not possible that we could be matched with Elohim's nature. Therefore, he becomes a man and takes on our nature, that there might be a union of natures. And in the Odes of Shalomo, as it's called, or the Odes of Solomon, it mentions, and he became like us, or he became like me, that I might know him. Third, because the bride is a slave, he pays her ransom, substitutes himself in her room, takes on her debt, 
and pays all that she owed to righteousness and then takes on with her. But on our part, just nothing at all. We had no hand in the covenant of redemption, no hand in the contrivance of deliverance. We knew nothing about the business. We had no thoughts of a redeemer, deserved nothing but pure wrath. We were lying with full contentment in the devil's territories when Mashiach was carrying on the match. Number six. How is the marriage concluded on his part? He sends forth his ambassadors to court for him, as Abraham did his servant for Yitzhak. And there is a great work indeed to make her, or to make her give her consent. Let messengers in Shamayim unite their powers of persuasion. They could not prevail with one soul if a converting day were not come. But they must always speak fair to her. How rhetorical was Abraham's servant for his master. He has but one child, and that child has great riches. He seeks no portion with Rebekah, only her consent. Thus he rhetorizes, or rhetorizes and flourishes exceedingly and persuades with the greatest motives. But yet the ambassadors of Mashiach have a larger commission, if our eyes were opened to see it, that they are sent forth to make love to the bride and in his name to commend Mashiach. Second, he concludes the marriage thus the bride being wretchedly ignorant of her true happiness. Therefore his father distresses her with the debt which she owes to him, and the wretched person is forced for some time to Mount Sinai, and there Elohim descends in all the circumstances of terrible majesty. He thunders against her, curses. Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians 3.10 Eloah exacts all the debt, conscience roars, and the devils are let loose. That should be demons. She fears hell and wrath, and Elohim declares in the Besora, or good news, that the wretched bankrupt shall go to prison and lie eternally in hell if she do not take on with his son, marry him, and believe on him. Thus the bride is forced to an extremity. Some have more, some have less of this law work, but all are humbled and broken in some measure. Who are married to Mashiach? He sends forth his ruach and convinces the world of sin. <clears throat> but this would not do either, and therefore, third, the bridegroom sees that nothing but condensation will do it. And that means that he's but he's condensating he's condensing he's condescending himself. He's belittling or lowering himself to a level that we can reach him at. And so he appear in all his esteem when the bride is full of fears, perplexities, and anxieties, when the terrors of Elohim are surrounding her and the arrows of the Almighty drinking up her spirits. And when she is crying out, What shall I do? Whither shall I go? Then the bridegroom appears in all his excellency and esteem and says, Behold me, behold me. And she gets a view of him that ravishes her heart and enlarges her soul. Then it is that the Ruach is sent to determine her to consent. The manifestation of his esteem does enlighten her mind in Ruach, and immediately favor upon the will, draws out the whole heart after him, so that if the bride could be grieved and pained upon the marriage day, it would be for her folly in refusing him so long. Yet what is done upon the bride's part for concluding the match? Nothing at all but the whole soul is enabled to acquiesce in a Redeemer. 
and the believer is ready at such a time to say he is my master, my L, my strength, my all, and shall be forever. Thus you have a brief scheme of the nature and way of this marriage. Having spoken but very briefly to the former heads, I shall here, before I proceed to the reasons of the doctrine, offer a few remarks upon the time of this marriage union between, or betwixt Mashiach and believers. We told you how this marriage was concluded and completed by Mashiach. And now we say, there is a stated day and time for the concluding thereof. And upon this head we may remark, first, that there is a twofold day we are to consider in this marriage, namely the day of espousals on earth and the day of consummation in Shemaim. And we may compare these two together in a few words. One, the day of espousals here is ushered in with a very dark morning, or rather an evening upon the bride's part, with the wrath of El and the law, as it was said, the evening and the morning was the day. So in this contract, the evening of legal terrors, at least some humiliation, ushers in the morning. Yet as to the consummation, there is a great deal of esteem before it's the soul being taken to Shamaim already. And the body sleeping sweetly in the grave, a bed where the bridegroom lay three days before her. 2. In the day of espousals, when the person gets a victory over corruption and finds little stirring of it, no sensible working of it, yet there is a party within, at the same time that opposes the match, and which will afterwards get out its head. And will still or and will be still assaulting the believer while he is on earth, meaning our carnal nature that fights against the truth and wants us to do evil even after we've come to knowledge of the truth, right? But in the day of consummation, there is no such thing, no enemy, no sin, no corruption, but the whole inner being goes out wholly upon the bridegroom. 3. The espousals are carried on secretly. It may be the person is sitting at your side, and you do not see, nor know when Mashiach is making up the match, or perhaps on his knees at home. There is a secret transaction, yet the consummation will be before millions of messengers, millions of kodeshim, or set-apart ones, and millions of spectators. Here is a great difference. After the day of espousals is over, the bride may give many squint looks to her old lovers, looking back to Mitzrayim or Egypt, departing from her husband, doubting of his love, distrusting his word, fearing his dispensations. Yet after the, consum after the consummation, no shadow of sin, no shadow of jealousy, no shadow of mistakes or fears can overtake her forever. No cloud can intervene, for the Son of Righteousness shall never be eclipsed any more. But then, two, a second remark is that the precise time of the espousals is condescended on by the bridegroom and his father from all eternity. The very moment when the bride shall be made to sign the contract and flee to Mashiach and pour out her whole soul upon him. That precise moment is agreed upon betwixt the Father and the Son in the covenant of redemption from eternity. 3. We remark that the bridegroom waits patiently for that moment that is agreed upon betwixt the father and the son. He longs for it. 
He desires it. The believer many times is ready to think, Oh, Mashiach is not willing. I have set days apart. I have gone to my knees. I have sought him in and about this and the other ordinance, and yet I could not close with him. I have been almost dipped in hell with affliction. Yet my heart was never melted. Surely Mashiach is not willing. Oh, let us flee the borders of blasphemy. The Master Yahushua is willing, but the fullness of the time is not yet come. There is a set moment for His coming to His people, and for this they are to wait. Yea, for this He waits Himself, according to that scripture, which I shall read to them that cannot get that in duties and ordinances, which they have been long looking for. Yeshayahu 30.18 Therefore will Yahuwah await that he may be favorable unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have unmerited tender loving kindness upon you. For Yahuwah is an El of judgment. Happy are all they that wait for him. He will wait upon the very moment of time for the day of deliverance. He knows the proper season. The crane, the swallow, and the stork know their seasons, but the natural instinct of El, or by the natural instinct, El has given them. And will he not know his own season? Yea, he waits to be favorable. Fourth remark. That when the time comes, then there is a sweet coming together of all circumstances to conclude the work. All things work pleasantly together to complete the match. Conscience goes right to work. The word is made lively. The ruach acts powerfully and sweetly in the soul. There is an auspicious conjunction of all favorable circumstances for determining the bride and drawing out her heart. Fifth remark, that there are several signs and characters of this day by which it may be known. What are the signs of it, you shall say? I shall not insist on this, only it is a yom or day of light. Great light breaks in upon the mind. It is a day of love. Much love is let in upon the heart. It is a day of power wherein the bride is persuaded and overcome, difficulties are surmounted, enemies conquered, the bride's will is molded into a compliance. It is a day of amazement. Oh, what an ecstasy of wonder is raised in the person's heart. I was blind, now I see. I was dead, now I live. I was weak, now I am strong. This morning perhaps I was under affliction and under the terrors of El. And now he has ravished me with the consolations of his Ruach. I was afraid of Hell. Now I have the expectation of Shamayim and eternal life. Oh, what a day of wonder is it. Lastly, it is a day of vows. The inner being will be ready to break forth in such a day, crying, What shall I speak for him? What shall I suffer for him? A sixth and last remark on this head is that in this stated day of espousals, the bridegroom manifests his esteem to the bride. When he intimates to the soul, Thy maker is thy husband, he shows his esteem his absolute esteem, his comparative esteem, his relative esteem. They are all one upon the matter, yet there is a formal different consideration of them. One, his absolute esteem is ma manifested. What does the soul see? That is matched and married to Mashiach. Alas, some see nothing but dreams and fantasies. But when the believer is matched with Mashiach, 
So he deals with him as with Moshe. He makes all his esteem to pass before him. The person gets a view of the esteemed attributes of the son of El. 2. He manifests his comparative esteem. You are more excellent than the hills of prey, fairer than the sons of men. The bride, the believer, sees him as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, every way incomparable. Whatever he be compared to, he excels it. If he be a lily, he is the lily of the valley. If he be a rose, he is the rose of Sharon. If he be a plant, he is the plant of renown. If he be a physician, he is the physician of value. If an advocate, he is an advocate with the Father. He is represented without any parallel. 3. His relative esteem is manifested. He is discovered as an esteemed Kohen, an esteemed foreteller, an esteemed king, an esteemed husband, an esteemed redeemer and deliverer. And there will be a sight of his esteemed fullness in all these relations, and the esteemed fitness of that sufficiency and fullness, all suited to the inner being. And thus revealing himself, he removes all jealousies and mistakes from the bride, supplies all her needs, heals all her diseases, and outbids all her rivals. Who can offer nothing to allure the soul? While he can and does say, I am all sufficient to help you. 3. I come now to the third thing proposed, namely, to offer some reasons of the doctrine. Why Mashiach comes under the marriage relation to believers? I answer first, his own sovereign will is the best reason why he comes under a marriage relation in this case. Even so, Father, for so it seems good in your sight. Matith Yahu 11.28 His actions are not to be examined at the bar of our reason. He has chesed or mercy because he will have mercy or un ten unmerited tender loving kindness. That's the meaning of chesed in its fullness. Another version of that is covenant love. Number two. His love to them makes him come under such a relation to them. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with everlasting kindness have I drawn you. Love is the motive that engages him. Love brought him out of Shemaim for them. Love nailed him to the tree for them. Love laid him in the grave for them. And love engages him to a marriage relation with them. 3. He does it for the esteem of his own free favor, chesed, or loving kindness and mercy, and love. As love and mercy was his motive, so it was his purpose that he might display and reveal it to the utmost. This attribute is at its utmost degree. Infinite wisdom could have contrived a thousand worlds, and infinite power could have made them. But the love of El has gone to its utmost height, and it is possible for Mashiach to give a greater demonstration of his love than he has done. Sorry, and it is not possible for Mashiach to give a greater demonstration of his love than he has done in giving his life for the bride and entering into a marriage relation with her. 4. He does it that he may furnish work for the Baruch company in the higher house, for on the earth the contract is only drawn up. This is only the day of espousals. Shemaim will be the day of the consummation of the marriage. 
This is only a courting and wooing time. But the day will come when the neptunal or yeah, neptunal solemnity shall be celebrated, and that shall continue while the day of eternity lasts. This shall suffice or suffice for the reasons of the doctrine. This is nuptial, not neptunal. I'm sorry for that, but we'll continue on. It says, the fourth thing was to make some application, and it may be one, for information, two, lamentation, three, examination, four, exhortation. Now of these in their order, one, for information, is it so that there is a marriage relation betwixt Mashiach and believers? One, this informs us of the infinite love of Elohim towards lost sinners in giving his own son to be a husband and redeemer unto them. Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him might not perish but have everlasting life. Yahukanon 3.16 Eloah so loved the world as neither messengers nor men can tell. Two, this informs us of the infinite love of Mashiach in condescending to be a husband to such a bride. It could never have entered into the heart of the wisest messenger in Shamayim that Mashiach, the eternal son of El, should become man, and far less that he should take on or take such a filthy and deformed creature and bride by the hand as sinners are. If he had given us our deserving, he would have made his righteousness to ride in triumph over us and hell to resound with eternal shouts of praise to incensed righteousness. But to the quite contrary, he has so ordered that Shemayim shall resound with eternal hallelujahs of praise to his esteemed loving kindness and free favor in choosing those that were enemies and admitting them to his Baruch bosom or his Baruch bosom. Three, this doctrine informs us of the believer's safety, having Mashiach for her husband who can hurt her. It is the duty of a husband you know to protect and defend his spouse, and to be sure Mashiach will not be lacking in this to his bride. He will hide them in the secret of his presence from the pride of men. He will keep them secretly in the pavilion from the strifes of tongues. Psalms 31.20 About all the esteem he makes a defense. Yeshayahu 4.5 and this is something you can see if anyone is ever read Charles Finney's lectures on revivals. It's also known as his autobiography. He knew that there was enemies that spoke against him and there's people that were contriving things against him. And he refused to have any dealing with it, trusting in Yahuwah alone. And he never had problems with them. Everything was always overcome in his favor. And he was able to be one of the greatest revivalists in, in the history of our times. <clears throat> he covers them with the mantle of his Ruach. Sure then, the bride of Mashiach is in absolute safety. He has retiring chambers for her to hide her in till the day of indignation be overpassed. For... This doctrine lets us see that believers are no such lowly and wretched persons as the world generally takes them to be. They are Mashiach's bride, and he is their husband. And oh, what an honor it is it to be married to the son of Elohim. Having him for an husband, they come to be related to all Mashiach's relations. Elohim is their father because he is his father. 
Messengers are their servants, because they are his servants. Kodeshim, or set-apart ones, are their fellow brethren, because they are his members. Shemaim is their inheritance, because it is the kingdom of their husband. In a word, whatever is his is theirs, and all things are yours, and you are Mashiach's, and Mashiach is Elohim's. 2 Corinthians 3, 22-23 Number 2. For Lamentation Is it so that there is a marriage relation betwixt Mashiach and believers? This calls for deep lamentation in these two particulars. One, it calls us to lament that Mashiach should have so few brides among us, though he be wooing and courting us by the good news, crying, Behold me, behold me. Yeshayahu 65.1 Yet where is the man or woman that is prevailed with to enter a match with this esteemed bridegroom? Though he be fairer than the sons of men, and condescends to offer marriage with sinners, who are as black and as ugly as hell itself. Yet they set him at naught and give him just ground for that melancholy complaint. My people would not hearken to my voice. Israel would not or would have none of me. Psalms 81.11 And may he not appeal to the very immaterial creation to judge of our folly as he did of old. To Yisrael, Yirmiyahu 2, 12 and 13. Hear, O Shemaim, and give ear, O Aretz. Yea, be astonished and horribly afraid. For my people have committed two great evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed for themselves, or hewed out cisterns, Broken cisterns that can hold no water. Number two. This doctrine may afford us matter of lamentation also, that believers who are espoused to him should walk so unworthily of such an husband. You know a wife should conduct herself con er, you know a wife should conduct herself to conform to the character of her husband and where her carriage is base and shameful it reflects a dishonor on him Oh how unsuitable is it to see Mashiach's bride blackened with the filth of hell to see those who have stricken hands with Mashiach in a marriage covenant, joining hands with lust and idols, and defiling themselves with them. Number three. For examination. Let us try if we be thus married and related to Mashiach, whether he be our husband, and we his bride and spouse. I shall offer a few remarks or a few marks whereby we may know whether or not we be married unto this esteemed husband. And they may be drawn from the consideration of the incidents, the constituents, and the consequence of this marriage. First, by the incidents to the marriage contract. Before ever Mashiach did contract with you, did you observe him courting your soul before this contract? Here is a courting. Now, how did Mashiach court you? One, did he court you by the, er, the austerity of the law, as with fire and sword? Did he court you by such a word as that? Thou art a cursed wretch. For cursed is everyone that continues not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians 2.16 Did he court you by such a word as that? Cursed is everyone that does the work of Yahuwah negligently. 
Did he court you thus by the ruach of bondage, with the terrors of El, as clothed with vengeance, telling you you are an heir of hell and wrath, a child of the shaitan or Satan, the adversary? Did he court you so as you were surrounded with fear and trouble? 2. Did he court you as by the austerity of the law, so by the sweetness of the besora, when he saw you cast down, when he saw you a poor heavy laden sinner, like to be crushed under your weights? Did he then court you with such a word as that, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest? Matthew Yahoo eleven twenty eight. Or with such a word as that, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. He that has no money, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Yeshayahu 55.1 Flee to your strongholds, you prisoners of hope. Did he thus court you with the good news offer? <clears throat> 3. Did he court you by his love letters? This is another <clears throat> incident of the contract. Got you ever a love letter sent from Mashiach out of Shamayim? But you will say, what is the love letter? Even the scriptures. Search the scriptures. These are they that testify of me. Yahoo Canon 539. Here there are the declarations of the love of Mashiach to the soul. Here there are love promises in these letters that shall be yours. There is a love covenant in these letters. Have you read and pondered them? And can you say that Mashiach spake them into your heart? If it be a text that were preached upon, or if it be a single word, O Mashiach, drop that into my heart, and I think it will go with me to my deathbed. It came with such life and power. In a word, got you any gifts before the marriage contract, such as the gift of true conviction, such as the gift of heart contrition, the gift of real humiliation, the gift of self-denial, the gift of steadfast fidelity. These are given some before and some at the contract. Secondly, try by the constituents of the marriage. 1. If this marriage be made up betwixt Mashiach and you, then you have put away all lovers besides Mashiach. The right hand will be cut off, the right eye put out. You will be divorced from all other husbands, particularly from the law. You must be dead to the law that you may be married to another husband, even to Mashiach. But you will say, What is it to be dead to the law? I answer, It is not to lay it aside as a rule of obedience, for the law shall still be the rule and standard of the believer's obedience, life, and conversion, or sorry, conversation. But to be dead to the law is to be sensible that the law cannot save us as a covenant of works. It is to disclaim all hopes of being declared right by the law or by our works or obedience to it. I see Mashiach, the esteemed husband, has brought in an everlasting righteousness, answering the law fully. This is the garment I must put on and cast off my filthy rags. 2. Have you given a cordial consent upon the contract day? Can you say you was enabled to take him as the psalmist or psalmist? O my soul, you have said unto Yahuwah, you are my master, and you are my El, my head, my husband. Have you given a rational consent to it? Yea, a super-rational and supernatural consent, a deliberate, chaste, 
stayed solemn, unconditional consent. Did you say it with steadfast fidelity and with an air of Shamayim that he was yours and shall be so forever? It is true persons may be matched to Mashiach who cannot condescend on the precise time. The Ruach may work many times some way that we cannot know, yet it is his ordinary way with his bride, after so many tossings, to break in with ravishing, or ravishing, yeah, ravishing, conquering sweetness, to draw forth her inner being to the solemn, remarkable closing with him and consenting to him. Have you then been engaged to make over yourself to the bridegroom by an unreserved re resignation of yourself to him, that you will not only take him wholly and forever, for set apartness and happiness, for light and life, for favor and esteem, but also make over yourself to him, soul and body, whatever you are, whatever you have been. Have you been thus made to yield yourselves unto Yahuwah? Are you one with him? Have you one Ruach with him? Are you of one steadfast fidelity with him? of one way with him, endeavoring to walk as he walked. He that is joined to Yahuwah is one Ruach, 1 Corinthians 4.17. Can you say that upon the marriage day you got a marriage gift from the bridegroom? Among the Yahudi, the bridegroom was to give a marriage gift to his bride. Now what gift did you receive on this marriage day? Can you say, indeed, I got the wedding garment? He clothed me with his righteousness, which he span out of his own bowels, weaved with his own hands, and dyed with his own blood. And thus all my guilt is covered. The curse is done away. This is indeed what few get, yet some have been and are able to say, I am delivered from the wrath to come and there is no condemnation to me. On such a time I got also an ornament of the favors with the Ruach, which I wear as jewels, that is to say, belief or steadfast fidelity, love, obedience, patience, humility, and I got the promise of, an, of a hundredfold here, and I am expecting more gifts yet before the marriage be consummated. I am expecting mere assurance or more assurance. I live in the expectation of esteem. I expect a sealed pardon of all my sins. And I look to get the earnest of the Ruach and more every day. Four. <clears throat> Another constituent of this marriage contract is the bride on that day puts off one veil and puts on another. This was the Yahudi custom. The brides put off the veil of bashfulness and put on the veil of subjection. Mashiach's bride before the marriage cannot look the bridegroom in the face, is ashamed to look upon him, but she is made to put off this veil in the presence of her former lovers and to take Mashiach by the hand. And then she puts on the veil of subjection, whereby she promises in his strength to subject herself to her husband's will. Have we thus promised to be obedient to his commands, in his own strength, whatever he enjoins us to do or suffer? Thirdly, try by the consequence of this marriage. Would you know if there has been a contract between Mashiach and you? Try then by the immediate consequence. One, did you see the king in his beauty, 
and such an esteem and excellency in him as could not be paralleled by all the esteem of ten thousand worlds. What was your converse with him on the contract day? Can you say he embraced me in his arms, and I embraced him in my heart, and there was sweet communion and fellowship betwixt him and me? 3. Were you crowned in the marriage day, so as you were known by others, as it were, to be the bride of Mashiach? The Yahudi, they not only crowned the bridegroom, but the bride also. You see what the crown is that Mashiach's bride should have. Revelation 12.1 There appeared a great wonder in Shemaim, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. The bride of Mashiach is crowned with the doctrine of the twelve sent ones. Number four. The bride of Mashiach keeps at home and delights in the bridal chamber. This is her delight in all the days of her life, to dwell in the house of Yahuwah to behold the beauty of Yahuwah, and to inquire in his temple. Ordinances will be sweet, meaning the instructions in the Torah will be sweet, being the galleries wherein the king is held. 2. Try by the qualities and duties of the bride, which are also the consequence to this marriage. 1. If you be Mashiach's bride, then you will love the bridegroom. Love is what every wife owes to her husband. Much more does the believer owe it to Mashiach, who has expressed far more love to this bride than ever a husband did to a wife. He loved her and gave himself for her. He shed the hottest blood in his heart to deliver and redeem her. You will love him with a love of desire. With my soul have I desired you in the night. With a love of delight, my meditation on him shall be sweet. With a love of benevolence, wishing well to his interest. If I forget you, O Yarushalayim, let my right hand forget her cunning. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I prefer not you to my chiefest joy. Psalm 127, 5 and 6. They that habitually love husband, wife, children, riches, or anything more than Mashiach have no reason to think that they are matched with him. 2. If we be married to Mashiach, we will trust in and depend on our husband. In whom can a wife trust if not in her husband? The believer rests on Mashiach for favor and esteem, and commits all to him, ventures all on him, and expects all from him. The soul that is espoused to Mashiach looks on the infinite virtue of his blood, the infinite efficacy of his ruach, the infinite fullness of his favor, the infinite dimensions of his love, the infinite steadfast fidelity of his promise. And all this he sees an infinite ground of hope. And thereupon he ventures and rolls all on him. Here he says, I will stay and rest. Here I will build. Here I am resolved to stay. Here I am resolved to live and die. 3. If we be married to Mashiach, we will have a zeal for his esteem. Some sacrifice Mashiach's interest to their own honor. But the believer says, let my master increase, though my name should never be heard of in the word. Let Mashiach be exalted. Oh, says Mashiach's bride, I would have all the world coming and adoring him. I would have all the world to love him. I would have all the world to praise him especially when she is under any lively influence. Then, says she, 
if the greatest enemies knew what were in our master, they would come and join with him as I have done. Four. The bride of Mashiach cannot live without him. An honest wife will be hard to put or hard put to it to live many years without her husband. Oh, it is sometimes like a hell to her to miss Mashiach in ordinances. Oh, the sore moans and heavy groans of the deserted soul that has had the experience of the sweetness of Mashiach. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Job 23.3 Oh, that it were with me as in months past. 5. If you be Mashiach's bride, you will be longing sometimes for his second coming. Less or more, you will desire the day of judgment and long for his appearance. The epilogue of all the spouse's sweet discourses is, Make haste, my beloved, be you like a roe or a young heart on the mountains of Beth Bethair, till the day break and the shadows fly away. And the conclusion of the whole scripture is, Come, Yahuwah, Yahushua, come quickly. Revelation 22.20 20. Can you say you have longed for his coming? I see the Shatan, or the adversary, reigns here. Corruption reigns here. And never will things be right till he come again in the clouds and set Shemaim and Aretz in a flame, when these nuptial solemnities shall begin to be celebrated, and the marriage solemnized while eternity lasts. 6. If there has been a marriage betwixt Mashiach and your inner beings, then readily you have some of the love tokens to present. I mean some expressions of his covenant love. You can tell that some time or other, he brought you to the banqueting house and displayed a banner of love over you. Sometimes he has enlarged your inner being with ardent and longing desires after him and satisfied you with the fatness of his house. The inner being that is really espoused to Mashiach will readily have some experiences of his love to tell of. 7. The spouse of Mashiach is a chaste spouse. Idols never get to her heart. Or, sorry. Idols never get her heart <clears throat> as before, though now and then she may give a squint look. Yet idols never have that force and room in her affections once they had. She is afraid of doing anything that may be displeasing and dishonoring to him. Hence we will find the spouse of Mashiach breathing out earnest desires and requests to Elohim to be kept and led in the way of righteousness. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Psalm 119.5 Hence she groans up the chase, or the case. <clears throat> o wretched one that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin and death? Romans 7.24 If we be Mashiach's bride, we will be a fruitful bride. Let us try, have we never a child of good works or of favor? Thy belly, says Mashiach to the spouse, is as a heap of wheat. Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, 7-2 You know wheat is very fruitful, the barren soul that never loved never mortified, never repented, never gave alms, never appeared for Elohim, 
that barren soul is not the spouse of Mashiach. Well, the spouse of Mashiach is fruitful, this much by way of trial. Fourthly, for exhortation. Is there a spiritual marriage betwixt Mashiach and believers? Oh, then, shall we not be persuaded to come and close with Mashiach for our husband, and to take our Maker for our husband, our El for our husband? If we be ambitious, here's the top of our ambition, Yahushua Mashiach. If we be covetous, here's the true riches, whatever we are, whatever we have been. If we come to him, he will in no ways cast us out. It is true, we cannot come of ourselves, but let us cry, Yahuwah, if I die, I shall be buried under the mercy seat, praying, weeping, looking as I can, to go to hell with Mashiach in my heart as much as I can. And hell is synonymous with Sheol or the grave. Okay. Come to him and he will overcome your whole impotency. Lay your case before him, saying, Yahuwah, I am a wretched one in the highest degree. Yahuwah, here is a great offer made. I have no heart to it. Oh, and give a discovery of a lost state and of your excellent esteem. Oh, draw out my heart and let me die upon the spot rather than reject Mashiach forever. Many motives might be adduced. Consider only one, the loveliness and beauty of Mashiach. His beauty is universal. He is lovely in his person, lovely in his nature, lovely in his offices, lovely in his estates of humiliation and exaltation, lovely in all his relations. His beauty is transforming. It will make the bride comely say, or comely also. It is communicative. The bride is made comely through his comeliness. When we speak of the comeliness of Mashiach, we should let messengers and set apart ones above that have the more intimate intuition of the radiant splendor of this Baruch object go forth to declare his esteem. Everything in him is lovely, and nothing is lovely without him. Nothing is lovely but what proceeds from him and goes to him. He is so lovely that he cannot possibly be otherwise. He is the primary, original, and necessary loveliness. 2. Consider as he is lovely, so he is loving. His love is infinite, eternal, free, distinguishing, effectual. Never let man loved like him. Oh, how many foldings are in this love, as can never be unfolded. 3. Consider, if we close with Mashiach, we will give him a glad heart. His heart is glad in that day when he takes a poor sinner by the hand. The day of his espousals is the day of the gladness of his heart. How many times have we grieved him by our hypocrisy, our formality, and backwardsness, or backwardness? <clears throat> and would we now give him a glad heart for all the grieved hearts we have given him? Then let us embrace him as offered in the good news, and then he will be glad. Why? Then he will see the fruit of election, the fruit of redemption, the fruit of his death, the fruit of his resurrection, the fruit of his ascension, the fruit of his intercession. Then he gets back the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh. which is the set-apart spirit. The lost sheep is found again. Then he gets back the member of his own body. I might give something by way of direction. 
you may say, what shall I do that I may be married unto Mashiach? In a word, if you would have Mashiach for your husband, oh then, entertain his suite or his suit, and hearken to his wooing and courting motions. He is darting light into your hearts and letting you see the evil of some sin that formerly you delighted in. Oh, do not resist his suit by continuing in sin after this. Is he strengthening that light so as to set conscience on fire with the sense of sin and apprehension of wrath? O oh, quench not this fire till you get water out of the wells of deliverance. Otherwise you reject his suit. Is he carrying the, his suit farther and stirring up your affections to desire after Mashiach? O oh, quench not this motion. But cry to him to fasten the nail sure and carry on the work till the marriage be completed. Now I might give a word of exhortation also to them that are married and espoused to Mashiach. All I shall say is this, O let Mashiach's bride live on him and take all from him. As a poor married woman to a rich man, she lives upon his riches. Many are ready to say that if Mashiach would call us his bride, we would live on ourselves and would pray, repent, believe, and etc. But the bride of Mashiach must get all these things in him and take all from him and live wholly on him and freely on him. When Yahusuf's brethren did not know him, they were buying and selling with him. They would have nothing from him without money. But when they knew that he was a brother, for all the offenses that they had done to him, they were content to come down, every man of them, and take all from him for nothing. This is the way you must do with Mashiach. When matched to him, we must not, with the legalist, have repentance and duties of our own. We must take all from him who is the repository of all Elohim's fullness, whereof the believer's part is, out of that fullness to receive favor for favor. All right. I thank you for your time. And Father willing, that would be edifying for everyone. You have a wonderful Shabbat, and we will see you next time.